Hello, everyone. Uh, so this is Amir Masood. Uh, it's my pleasure to uh, introduce and welcome Sharon Baswani to the Vector Institute today. Uh, Sharon is an assistant professor at SFU. Uh, he did his PhD at UBC and also uh, postdocs at Mila and University of Alberta. Uh, his work is uh, on sequential decision making as well as optimization. And if you read his uh, papers, it is clear that well he has very strong background in both optimization and RL. And uh, today he's going to talk about decision ever after critics, this function approximation, which I believe is a very recent submission that they had. Uh, so without any further ado, uh, I'll let Sharon talk about this research. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you for the invitation. Uh, so this work is going to be between our two papers. Uh, the first one was uh, published like two years ago, and this uh, the main topic is uh, something that we did very recently. Uh, right, so let's get started. Um, so the motivation for this work uh, started with these observations uh, that policy gradient based on reinforced these updates. The pol each policy update requires recomputing the policy gradient. So every uh, iteration you interact with the simulator compute the policy gradient, which involves computing like the Q functions or the advantages, and then you update the policy. So this has theoretical guarantees, even with function approximation, and there are like a bunch of nice papers. Uh, but because this, each update requires a computationally extensive interaction with the environment, it is not very practical. So in practice, people use methods such as CRPO, CPO, and NPO. So all these methods roughly uh, rely on constructing surrogate functions. So they construct these surrogate functions and update the policy to maximize these surrogates. And these support what I'm going to call as off-policy updates, that they can update the policy. So you can update the parameters of the policy without requiring additional environment interaction. Okay? And these methods are um, uh, widely used in deep RL, and these are the ones that we want to study. The problem is uh, that these methods have theoretical guarantees, mostly in like the tabular setting, and even in some simple scenarios, like this paper shows that PPO can uh, fail to convert. Okay? So no, there is no systematic way to design theoretically principled surrogate functions or a unified way to analyze their properties that scale to function approximation. So that is the main motivation for our talk. And this is going to be the outline, so I'm just going to describe the problem formulation. And the first part of this talk is going to address these uh, surrogate functions, and we're going to see what guarantees we can prove. And the second part of this talk is actually the title, which is a decision of our actor. So we need to know this, and this framework I'm going to extend to actor critic in the second part of this. Okay. Um, so what is the problem formulation? So everything is mostly standard. Um, so we're going to assume a infinite horizon discounted MDP, uh, state space, action space, uh, transition probabilities, rewards, initial state distribution is a row, and gamma is a discount. So Everything is usual except that I'm going to refer to as a policy by pi and its corresponding distribution over actions by p pi. So these two things are going to be different, and we will uh, uh, I'll explain why on the next slide. So for each state s, p pi introduces a distribution over the action, and the state occupancy is d pi of s. Uh, this is exactly the same uh, definition as is usual, and we also have the state action distribution. Uh, occupancy measure, which is new. So this tells you how many times you visit a particular state uh, with discounted. Okay. And the expected return is going to be referred to as j pi. So this is the cumulative return across um, cumulative infinite discount, uh, infinite horizon discounted uh, reward. And this is the thing that we want to maximize. So given a set of feasible policies, capital Phi, uh, we want to maximize. This is the standard policy gradient objective. And the five star, and we can denote as like the mass. So this is the standard problem formulation that we're going to look. At. Okay. So a slide that is important in throughout this talk is that we have to push between what it means to be a policy's functional representation and its parameterization. So these two things are going to be different, and that is like one of the things in this talk that is important. So by functional representation, I mean a policy sufficient statistics. Okay, so this can be implicit. So we are going to consider two types of ways to represent the policy. Okay, so whenever I say representation, it's like a way to represent this policy. 
So you can like completely specify a policy by telling me about its conditional distribution, p pi of uh, a given s for each state and action. Okay? This is what I'm going to refer to as the direct uh, functional representation. Or instead of just directly representing the probabilities, we can do it via logic. So I can have z pi s a as these logic. And if I tell you all the z pi s a for every state and action, I have told you the, the policy. Okay? So the policy is represented using the z pi s a. And this is going to be different from the policy parameterization. So for this talk, the parameterization is going to be a realization. Okay? So you could have a tabular parameterization for the direct function representation. So this means that you have S times A number of parameters, and you're going to represent every P pi of A given S by a parameter. Or if you want to make have a linear parameterization for a soft max function representation, that means each logic is now a linear function, and theta are the parameters that we want to learn, and x, s, a are the state action features. Okay? So the point is that the functional representation of a policy is independent of its parameterization. Okay? So these two quantities are going to be completely independent. Okay, so what is the standard way to do policy gradient? We use a model, so it can be a neural network or a linear model with these parameters theta, and we directly parameterize the uh, representation of the policy and optimize j of pi of theta. So this is a composite function. So j is a function of the policy, and the policy is a function of the parameter. So we are, the standard policy gradient approach is that you optimize j pi of theta with respect to theta just by doing gradient. So this, uh, any questions at this point? So this is all kind of standard, except I have just uh, explicitly distinguished between what it means to be a policy function representation versus this parameter. So now that we have that set up, an idea for the first paper is that instead of optimizing with respect to theta, I'm going to iteratively optimize j with respect to pi and project onto capital pi. So capital pi, which is the class of feasible policies, are the things that depend on the parameterization. So instead of optimizing with respect to theta, I'm going to optimize with respect to pi and project, keep projecting onto this class of feasible policies. So so the process of this talk, I'm going to overload pi to be a general functional representation. So as soon as I say a policy, it's pi, and it refers to either like the distribution over actions or the logic. Okay, and pi of theta is the way I represent, uh, the way I parameterize this pi. Okay, so the model with which I parameterize is implicit in this notation. So if I say pi of theta, there is some underlying model that maps the theta to the pi, and I kept it implicit because, as you will see, the theoretical guarantees don't really care about what this uh, parameterization is. Okay, so we're going to have like, these guarantees which are independent. Okay, so a quick introduction to mirror descent or mirror ascent. Um, strictly convex differentiable function, capital Phi, is going to be the mirror map. The mirror, the Bregman divergence, basically is a way to quantify the distance between two policies, Phi and Phi Phi, and it looks like this. So in the standard case, if I choose the mirror map to be the Euclidean norm, the d phi pi pi prime is the Euclidean distance between the two. Okay, and mirror descent exactly becomes equal to mirror uh, to gradient descent. Okay, so what does the mirror ascent update look like? Every step. So this is the primal space. So for one way to explain mirror ascent is to explain this to be the primal space, this to be the uh, dual space. This is the space of iterate. This is the space of gradient. So you take a current policy pi t, map it using this uh, nabla of pi to the dual space. Do a gradient descent step there. So this is the gradient descent step, ascent step there. Get to this point and then map it back using the inverse of this function. Okay. And now because you're, you need not be you need not be in the class of feasible policies, so we need to project onto the class of feasible policies, and this is the Bregman project. So you project by minimizing the distance, which is measured according to this d phi. So this is a mirror ascent. Another way of uh, thinking about this, uh, an easier way that we will use, is that phi t plus one is the arg max over phi. So this is the projection step. You follow the gradient and ensure that you do not get too far away from the current policy, and how is far measured, it is measured according to like this uh, notion of diverse. Okay? So that's the middle. 
Okay, so the part that the parameterization influences is this projection. So this, the class of feasible policies are the ones that can be represented by a neural network. So it's this projection that depends on the parameterization. So the complexity of the projection onto capital pi depends on the parameterization. So for example, the set pi tabular parameterization for a linear parameterization is still a convex set in theta. But if you use a crazy neural network, this capital pi is restricted and is actually non-convex. And even the meaning of projection is indefined. Okay, so this is going to be a problem because I claim to you I'm going to prove these type of guarantees for like any kind of uh, function approximator. Okay, so what we are going to do is a reparameterization. So we are going to say capital pi consists of policies realizable via parameter model. So every pi over here, there is a corresponding theta that realizes this, uh, this pi. So this minimization is equivalent to this minimization. All I have done is I have replaced a pi in the set capital pi by pi of theta by its parametric realization. And this immediately ensures that pi t plus one is in capital pi. But this does not solve our problem because this thing is a still non-convex. So we have just replaced the non-convexity from the projection into this uh, following this one. How are we going to do this? Uh, with this reparameterization, the update is, so I'm just going to write everything again. So pi t plus one is the realization at these parameters theta t plus one. And theta t plus one is the solution to this potentially uh, non-convex function because this pi of theta, there is a neural network hiding over it. So this is a hard function to optimize. What we are going to do, and this is what I'm going to refer to as my surrogate function. Okay, so this is LT that depends on pi, which is the representation, the mirror map, and my step size because it's over here. Okay. So this is my uh, functional mirror ascent update. And this is non-concave in general. This is hard to maximize, and we are just going to optimize it using uh, a gradient base. Okay. Uh, is, is all of this clear at this point? Okay. So this is our algorithm. So compute the gradient at pi t, form the surrogate. So as soon as you have formed the surrogate, optimizing the surrogate does not require updating the gradient. So the gradient here is always at pi t. Okay. So this means that the maximization of the surrogate does not involve interacting with the simulator. So these are what I'm going to call as off policy assets. Okay. So what we have done, we have formed a surrogate, we have used the gradient to form a surrogate, and then I'm going to just keep optimizing the surrogate and updating my work. Okay, so now this is starting to look like a TRPO or a TPO based method because they have also have a surrogate. But uh, let's see what we can prove. So, so let's uh, do one slide on theoretical guarantee. So the surrogate looks like this, and it is some um, kind of non-convex function. Um, but there are two sufficient conditions necessary uh, to ensure that I get monotonic policy. Okay, so the least thing you would want is that every time I run this procedure, my policy at, at least it improves. Okay, so all we are going for at this moment is that I want j pi t plus one to be greater than j pi t, okay? So, yeah. Uh, greater than equal. So it will never make the policy worse because if you are like near the solution, it's not gonna improve it. Near the station point, it's not gonna So there are two, two conditions that we need. We need that the inner loop update improves the surrogate value. So we are doing gradient ascent on the surrogate, so we want LT theta t plus one to be greater than LT theta t. Okay, so this is just saying gradient ascent actually ascends on the function, so it does its job. And the more important property is that the surrogate is a global lower bound on J pi of theta. So we need for all theta, the surrogate to be below the original function. So if you push the surrogate up, it pushes the original function up, and that is what leads to improve. Okay, so that is the intuition that we are going for. And just to give you one line of inequality why this is true, so if these two conditions are satisfied, let's start from j pi t plus one. This by definition is j of pi at the parameter theta t plus one. This is the model. This is greater than LT theta t plus one. This is because the surrogate is a lower bound. And now because I improve the surrogate by condition one, 
LT theta t plus one is greater than or equal to LT theta t. LT theta t, if you plug in theta t in this equation, you're going to get back j pi theta t. Okay, because this is going to become zero, this is going to become zero. So the divergence between two same policies is equal to zero. So by definition, LT theta t is equal to j pi theta t, which is equal to j pi t. Okay, so moral of the story, if condition one and two is satisfied, I can get monotonic policy. Okay, how to satisfy these conditions is the next question we're going to answer next. But if this is true, and because j pi is upper bounded by one over one minus gamma, we are going to get convergence to a stationary. Okay, so we are going to show that if you actually maximize the surrogate, um, and this uh, surrogate is a global lower bound, uh, you can get convergence to a stationary point for any policy parameterization. So I have not even made room for the policy parameterization explicit. This is just because of like this majorizing property. Okay, so condition one is satisfied if we set the parametric step size to be smaller than the smoothness alpha, which is the parametric step size, needs to be set according to the smoothness of the surrogate. Okay, so if alpha is less than or equal to one over beta, and for any number, for m here is the number of inner loops you do, the number of off policy updates. So for any m greater than or equal to one, and any for any alpha. Uh, less than or equal to one over beta, it guarantees that. Okay, so this is like a sufficient condition for guaranteeing that there is ascent on the function that you're optimizing. And condition two is satisfied by setting the functional step size, so this eta, this eta, according to the relative smoothness of j phi with respect to d phi. So mathematically, what it means is any eta that ensures that this function, j plus one over eta times phi is convex in phi, guarantees the second condition. So as soon as you guarantee one and two, we are going to get mon monotonic policy. Yes, that's right. So the first is parametric smoothness, and the second one is functional smoothness. Okay. Uh, whatever parameterization, if it is, if the surrogate is smooth, then you can directly set the step size like this. If not, you need to set the step size in a different way. But uh, that's non-smooth optimization. So, kind of follow-up question about like this condition that j plus one over mm -hmm. h of c is a convex. So, I guess you can construct c if you know the smoothness of j, right? Yes. Yeah, Which kind of depends on your parameterization. Oh, of your j as a function of phi. So there is no theta in this second condition. Okay, so this now the question is that, uh, so that depends on MDP, right? That depends on MDP, yes. And can, do we know it yes. beforehand? So next, slide, next two slides, I'm going to uh, instantiate a representation, uh, set a mirror map, and tell you what okay. that is. Okay, so that's, yeah, that's next, next. So the other question I think is that, Condition two is requiring for all theta, uh, so it's a global uh, yeah. lower bound. But I guess you actually just need it on the theta that are generated through the algorithm. Yeah, yeah. Is it is it possible to somehow like relax it? No, I mean we tried thinking about it, but we did not want to touch the parameterization at any point. So that's why we didn't like in an oblivious way. So if you see how we did it, it's just using the smoothness of j phi. So just forget about the parameters. Think you're in the tabular setting. So in the tabular setting, what is, how smooth is j phi with respect to this metric, d phi, and that is a property that we use to test. Okay, kind of another question, maybe re it's related to what you just mentioned, but can uh, this uh, functional mirror ascent, can you change that mirror mapping at each iteration, yes. like a C of T instead of C? Yeah, yeah. technically yes, and we do actually. Uh, the next slide, I'm going to show you how. Okay. <laughs> yeah, it's only like a weighting that we changed, so we didn't do anything fancy, but yes, you potentially could. Okay, any other question? Yeah? Uh, so uh, Uh, the gradient of j phi with respect to theta. Yeah, like the standard stationary point. Yeah, yeah. Uh, 
No, lo- local. It could be local. Yeah. yeah. So you need like other assumptions to guarantee that you will reach five stars. Uh, so I, in one of the appendices, we have like if some other conditions are satisfied, like this uh, surrogate needs to satisfy some gradient domination condition. So if that is true, then you can reach a globally optimal policy. This one? Yeah. So like these. Yeah. Uh, yes. So this is the functional one, and every functional is uh, parameterized. Like the functional representation has a corresponding parameterization because that's how you realize it. So that's phi. So this is the model at these parameters to that teacher. Uh, right, like so. Yes, at this point, we need the functional gradient. Yeah, this is the gradient that is fine. Yeah. And as you will see on the next slide, this is like the Q function for the direct one. Yeah. Okay. One. Okay, so here is an example. Okay, so let's uh, say that the policy is represented by these uh, distributions, P pi uh, of uh, A given S, and these are for every state. So in this case, I'm going to choose my mirror map to be of this form. So it's a weighted uh, average according to what is the state occupancy measure of the state. So it's some over states d pi of s and some mirror map between the distribution for every state. Okay, and because these are distributions, the obvious choice is to use a negative entropy mirror map. Okay, so in this case, the functional gradient like the gradient of j with respect to pi, or in this case p pi, because that's our functional representation, is just d pi of s, q pi of s. And in this case, the surrogate function, we can instantiate to be this. So I have kept, so this is my divergence, and this is the functional gradient. Okay. So this is in terms of q pi t of s a, an important sampling ratio, minus one over eta times some divergence between the distribution between uh, at every state. And because these are distributions, I'm going to choose phi, the mirror map, to be the negative entropy, and this is going to make the distance between the two distributions like the KI. So I have the, my surrogate is uh, Q pi T of SA, and the parameterization is over here. So remember, I am parameterizing the functional representation. In this case, the functional representation is this probability. So the theta is going to show up here. This is theta t, so this is fixed. This is the place that we need interactions with the simulator, and all of these are under mu pi t. So in order to update this with respect to theta, you don't need to interact with the simulator, and that's the off-policy part of this part. Is this okay? Okay, and like I promised, for any policy parameterization, we can guarantee that j phi of theta is greater than the surrogate. Surrogate is a global lower bound if eta is less than. Theta. So this is a, a property only with respect to the policy, and right? there is no parameterization. Yeah. So I have to look at which of phi the map depends on the MD. Uh, yes. So. How, so why do, why is it Oh, I mean, it's like you see distribution and you make it uh, a negative entropy. But the part that depends on the MDP is this weighting. It's the, these are like the. So they find other files that are more MDP aware. Yes. Uh, yeah, you like you roll out. So all these expectations are under the same d pi t. So let's just roll out, take the gradient, like standard procedure. So there are two problems with this. One is that it involves important sampling ratio because you are using data collected by a pi t 
for a different policy. So this is a penalty you have to pay. And the other one is that this scale divergence is inverse. So you're making it more CK. So this is going to hinder exploration. So an easy way to optimize this part would be to keep, put all your probability mass on one mode. Okay, and because of that, it's like in this exploration. So ideally, we want this KL to be reversed. We want the forward KL, and we need a dependence. So we are going to definite dependence on the important sampling ratio, but we want it to be born benign. So that is uh, the next slide. Okay, but any questions before this? Uh, which one? This? Yeah. Oh, yes. Yeah, yeah. Yes, yes. This is strictly common. It's like one plus pi, like the Hessian. So that's positive. Okay. So the other way to do it is to represent the policy now by, by using learn logic. So p pi of a given s is proportional to this exponential in of z pi s a. And now I'm going to parameterize the z pi. So I'm going to parameterize my function representation, and that's going to be the logic. Okay. In this case, again, we need to choose a Bregman divergence, and I'm going to choose it again weighted by d pi of s. In this case, the function gradient, again, by just the policy gradient theorem for like tabular settings, is d pi of s, a pi of s a, and then this our distribution comes up again. To do this, you get this sort of Okay, so it is uh, looking at the set phi z, which is a divergence between z is a divergence between these logics. Okay, so these logics are real numbers. So good way, uh, a good mirror map to use is other log sum x. So I'm going to use phi of z of s is the log sum of the x of these logics. If I use this. This is the surrogate I want. And in this case again, uh, we have a similar property that you can set eta to ensure that the surrogate is a global lower bound. And in this case, there is no dependence on the number of state for actions, it's just less than one minus. Okay, and that ensures that the surrogate is a global lower bound. Okay. Any questions? I have one more slide on this one. Uh, to, yeah. So in the previous case, it should be uh, yes, it depends on the number of states because or, or number of actions. Sorry, yeah, yeah, because we did the bound in like a lazy way. Uh, I don't think it's like fundamental. Um, okay, so this is uh, where we are at. Let's see what the surrogate looks like. So if you write it in a different way, we can write it in this way. Uh, so this is. Now it involves a log of the important sampling ratio. So that's the dependence on the important sampling ratio is more benign. And now we have a forward k. Okay, so the KL direction, if you notice, has reversed. That's P pi at theta t. So this is the fixed quantity, and this is the quantity that we are offering. Okay, and now it uh, is mode covering because the way to minimize maximize this is to keep probability mass at every mode as this is going to blow up. Okay, and that's why it encourages it. So compared to TRPO, so if you look at TRPO, the surrogate function they use looks like this. So there are two differences. One of them is that instead of the important sampling ratio, we have the log. And they enforce the constraint between policies that we do not want to move too much in the policy space by our constraint. And we do the same thing by our regularizer. Okay. The nice part is we know how to set eta, whereas delta for them is a tunable hyperparameter. And if you run TRPO, it depends on, on quite a lot on the delta. And the other nice part is that we can ensure monotonic policy improvement and regardless of the policy parameterization, whereas the original TRPO paper only has guarantees in the tabular. Okay. So this is the second way that we instantiated uh, this definition. Yeah, I have some kind of very common or question, some, something between. Uh, so here, uh, I guess you first chose the parameter or the representation and also chose the T, the mirror map, and then 
subscribe to some forms that sometimes are not suitable, sometimes are suitable. And I guess the way you decided whether it's suitable or not is that whether basically we have a nice important sampling ratio or not, is a log of it or the directly, or whether it is more sticking or uh, not. Uh, so it kind of seems that we choose some C and representation and then decide based on the result whether that's a good one or not. Yeah. And I guess kind of my question is that I'm wondering whether it is possible to start from the other way around, like saying that we want some certain properties, like it's the exploring policy, mm -hmm. uh, what C should we choose? Yeah. yeah. So the problem is that the number of keys for mirror descent are very few. Um, so it's hard to get like such fine grained control. Um, Why is it very few? Is it like, isn't it enough to be like strictly convex? Yeah, but uh, okay. So one thing that we tried is uh, just the Euclidean norm and then you don't get like this nice uh, property. Right. Um, so you could choose other strictly convex functions, change like the preconditional. Uh, that will help with this part, but getting the log and uh, I think getting the log in the property of like the representation, but the C is the one that like you can uh, mess around with this. Stuff. I see. Okay, so C kind of defines the penalty. The, what kind of penalty we get at? Yeah, like how should you measure distance between policies? Okay. And add that as like a regularizer. Um, so I think we tried like the Euclidean one, some preconditional one. Um, we tried a different representation, like using like some linear programming stuff, but that leads to surrogates which are not as nice. So I think in the end we just like have to be. Yeah, for the probabilities, the C is like some form of entropy, the salad entropy, negative entropy, some form of entropy. Uh, so again, we didn't see like any much benefit. I'm kind of wondering whether we can have a value of the. Uh... Yes, that would be yeah yeah. Some awareness is going to come in the next part. Yeah. Yeah. Kind of second quick question, like here you showed also improve uh, house improvement. Can you also show rate conversions? Yeah, so this rate uh, is one over T. So you can get order one over T convergence. And if you run it for T iterations, you can get order one over T convergence to a stationary point where okay. the gradient, with gradient of J with respect to theta is. Uh, okay. It seems that we have That is what we wanted to do. So, because one of our representations is a probability, the other is a real number, and we wanted to get a KL from both of them. So, if you want to get a KL out from the logic, the only way, I mean, the way we knew how to do it is to use log sum x. And that is one reason we wanted to use log sum x. Um, and later on, you will see that log sum x and the negative entropy are actually central conjugate. So that is one way in which this is related. Like you choose the representation, uh, probability reals, and then the corresponding mirror maps are like conjugate. So they are like the primal space and the dual space are just swapped. So there is a connection, but how to uh, choose a better mirror map, we don't know yet. Okay, let's conclude the first part of the talk. Okay, so we use uh, functional mirror ascent to get this SMAPG framework, which ensures monotonous improvement. You can use this to lift existing tabular results. So if you have a convergence result of, say, convergence to the optimal policy for a tabular set for the tabular setting, you can use SMAPG to lift it to like the linear function approximation set. You can get exactly a very similar convergence result, and the proof has changed only by a little bit. So this is like if you want, if you care about doing like Proof techniques, so this is like an easy proof technique to use to like get function approximation guarantee. And then uh, we have like results in the paper. So we tried it on like simple tabular MDPs. They are competitive with TRPO, PPO. The more interesting part was 
the framework suggested an alternative method called SPPO, which is a form that looks like PPO. And then when we test it, it actually outperforms uh, PPO and like Mojoko. Uh, so that was like one nice uh, result that came out. Yeah. Uh, so, I, oh, I see. Uh, so, I should say this the word suggest is important because it does not exactly fit in our framework because you have to clip things. So, similar to PPO, we clip the important something issue, but the clipping is on the log. So, that's the difference from PPO. So we went, changed the PPO one line of code, we added a log, and it just improves the result. So that's all we did. Yeah. And there are like a bunch of ablations in the paper. Yeah. Okay, so part two. So up to now, we are on knowing the true gradient, right? We need the gradient of J with respect to pi, and this involves either Q pi or A pi. Uh, this information is rarely available, and this is kind of a bummer. So there are a few things we could do. We can estimate using Monte Carlo samples. You can estimate the gradient, like the Q function, using Monte Carlo samples. And, but this has high variance, and that's going to be a problem. The other option is to use a critic. So you uh, so gradient, the functional gradient, using a value-based method. Uh, results in a low variance, but potentially biased estimate. And in this case, the problem is, the critic is usually trained by minimizing like some sort of TD error. Okay, so you are minimizing an error on the value estimation, and it's not clear how this relates to actually achieving a good policy. Okay, so this is the decision aware part of this talk. Okay, so what we would want is so we have a lack of a theoretically principled objective to jointly train the actor and the critic, and this is what we want. We want an objective just following what I showed thus far to get a joint objective so that I can say. Uh, I'm going to optimize the critic and the actor, and they're jointly going to J pi. Okay, so that is uh, what we are going to try and do now. Is, is the motivation clear? Um, yeah, I think this is a value-aware crowd, so uh, everyone knows this motivation. So if you have like a restricted critic, you want to place the function capacity on the things that actually matter towards achieving a good policy. Okay? So we don't want to really care about mm -hmm matching, minimizing the value estimation error uniformly everywhere. Okay, so this is the second part, um, decision aware actor. Okay, so the idea is that we had this lower bound on J5 that I used um, as the surrogate, and we want to generalize this to handle inexact gradient. Okay. So the thing we proved in the paper is that if you have a gradient estimator, okay, so G hat T, is an estimator of the functional gradient, and it could be any gradient estimator. So we are not putting any constraints on that yet. Um, and for some trade-off parameter C, such that again, J plus one over eta phi is convex in phi. This is exactly the same uh, condition from before. If phi star is the potential conjugate of phi, then J phi minus J phi t can be bounded in terms of this green term and the blue term. So if you look closely at the green term, this is like a surrogate function that we maximized previously. But instead of having the true functional gradient here, I have G hat T, so I have my estimator. Okay, And the penalty to swap out the true functional gradient instead of an estimator G hat T is this blue term. Okay? So the blue term is the price of misestimation of this functional gradient. So if this G hat T is equal to the functional gradient, this term is going to disappear, and we are back in the setting of the first part of the talk. Okay. And the other important thing is that this error is measured in this divergence induced by phi star. Okay. So phi star is the functional, uh, is the potential conjugate, and this is what um, you should measure the error. Okay. So two things, the green part is the actor part, so it's the surrogate function that we were optimizing. It's very similar to that. And the blue part, basically, because it is an error in the gradient, it is an error in the Q function or the advantage. So that this is going to serve as a critic object. So that is uh, what is going to happen. 
So to maximize policy improvement, so if I want J phi minus J phi T to be large and positive, I want to maximize the right-hand side. So in order to maximize the right-hand side, an algorithm should learn a G hat T, which minimizes the blue term, and compute a policy that maximizes the green. Okay? And this is exactly the actor and the critic object. So the actor objective is to maximize this green term, and the critic objective is to minimize the blue term. So we now have a joint objective in terms of both the actor and the critic, uh, but the only thing we did, we just extended the lower bounds that from the first part of it. The other thing I should say is this P is a hyperparameter that basically relates how much you can move as an actor compared to how much critic error there is. So if there is no critic error, so in the sense that if G hat T is a perfect estimator, then the blue term is zero. So I can set C to be infinity. If I set C equal to infinity, I get exactly the update I had in the previous. If this critic error is very large, in order to account for it, so just think of this, this blue term scales as like order C. So if the critic error is large, I want C to be small. If I set C to be small, I'm increasing the regularization. That means I'm not moving too much. So the algorithm says, if the critic error is very large, you should not move too much. If it is small, you can take big steps. So that's how it's uh, constraining the movement of the app. Any questions? So we added, subtracted the, from the previous inequality, you add, subtract G hat T, and then you use a sort of a potential Young inequality, but it's Bregman equivalent. So we lifted the potential Young thing to like consider Bregman divergence. Other question? Yes. Yeah. Since this is inequality, how tight it is? I guess it depends on. Yeah. So, so let's see. Or maybe when is it tight? When is it? When does it actually become equality? So if pi is equal to pi t, pi is equal to pi t. Okay. Then the green term becomes zero, and then the blue term becomes zero if you have a perfect gradient. Okay. And then the left hand side also. Okay. Yeah. That's the place side. Um, no, I don't think so, no. Yeah. I mean, we do require gradient domination in a different place, so, uh, yeah, but uh, not really. Okay, so now we can just turn this into an actor critical algorithm. What is the algorithm? So let me go over the input. So you choose the function representation. You choose the mirror map. How many iterations do you want to run this for? And like these inner loop. So what what is the algorithm? You estimate the gradient of J with respect to pi. So using sampling or TD, uh, some way to estimate it. Form this capital L T of omega. So omega are the critic parameters now, um, and minimize this function as a function of omega. So this critic update are the minimization of this capital L T of omega. Okay, so you are trying to minimize the blue term, and then. Once you have G hat T, you put this, form the surrogate, the green term, which is L, small lt, and then do exactly the same thing that we were doing in the first part. Yes? Yep. Oh, you can do this via Oh, you can do this by TD. So you can use bootstrapping at this point. Yeah, and you can, I think in the paper we say you can use like any method you, you, you would use, like bootstrapping TD0, TD, like some TD lambda, and you just get like some estimates. And these don't need to be estimates for like all the states and actions. You can just fix that S A S prime. 
So if I were to replace this blue term by like the squared law, it is exactly the actor critic we know and love. Okay, because if I replace this by the square now, this term and this term will subtract out and I'll be left with this. So this is like you try to fit this and this now is a target and the target is like a bootstrap target. Yeah, so the gradient is the Q function. Yeah, I'm going to, I should have put this slide later, but yeah, yeah. I'm going to instantiate it on the next slide. Because the gradient Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Okay, so let me instantiate it. So again, let's choose the direct functional representation, uh, in which case I'm going to use the probability over the uh, actions as my pi. And again, I'm going to use the negative entropy mirror map, set the eta in the same way, and this is the lower bound I get now. So the green part is the same, exactly the same as we saw previously, and the blue part now is the critic loss. Okay, so just by instantiating this, now I have a critic loss, and now this is the thing I was saying. This is the dependence on the q minus q hat. Okay, um, and this q hat, uh, this q, you can do bootstrap. Um, few things to note: the lower bound holds for any policy or critic parameterization. So wherever you see a p pi, you can make it p pi as a function of theta. So that's the model for the p pi, and wherever you, you see a q hat. This can be some model of q pi that depends on omega. Okay, so omega are the critic parameters. The model is implicit in this notation. For the lower bound holds because the lower bound is at like the functional level. Okay. So the blue term here is a critic term. Yes. And what we are optimizing, what we are changing is our parameters of the Hat yes, the that's right. So, what is the what are the keys without the hat? These ones. Yes. These are the ones that you can estimate by TD. So, so these are like the targets. Exactly. Yeah. So, or use or samples. Or if you know the dynamics, you know Q pi. You have a question? Oh yeah, that's uh, yeah. If you give me one minute, it's the uh, next point. Yeah. Oh, okay. yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah. So the blue term is the decision aware critic loss, and we call it decision aware because minimizing it directly leads to a policy improvement. Okay, so it is aware of the current policy, and like you said. It is asymmetric, so the underestimation versus overestimation now matters, and it is different from the standard squared law. Okay, so now this is kind of neat because it tells us that in some places underestimation versus overestimation, the sign matters. So you don't, you're not going to treat both these errors in the same way. Okay, and if you look at this part, the second part, this is like log sum x. So this is like a soft map. So there is some sort of max, but you are smoothing it out. Okay. So this is the uh, critic loss. Okay. So, uh, so you mentioned that you we can use a bootstrap to estimate q pi t. Uh, is that a good idea, given that that might be kind of biased estimate of that? Um, Should we also rethink our TD or, or bootstrap estimate? Yes. Yeah, so, so that part we haven't rethought yet. Okay, but does it make sense even? Or? I mean, in this, the thing that will change is the TD error, right. which is, so when we update our Q functions, we have the TD error, but which is actually like the gradient of the squared law. But now this guy is going to be the gradient of this blue term. Yes. The form of the TD error has already changed. Yes. But whether we should use bootstrapping or not, next, next question. Yes. 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 So, 
for we made a jump, we justified this by the time Yes. Yes. Uh, well, yes, it's easier to compute, but how does this affect like the theory I showed earlier? Are two slides from now. The third is when Q is the exact Q by the environment, mm -hmm. right? This is saying and Q minus Q has of the error in the creating and yes. different function of all these errors in state action pairs, right? Yeah. Yeah, I have a cute example on the next slide, like a bandit example to show you that if you are being decision aware, it actually helps. Um, okay, so let me go to that. Okay, so here is an example, simple bandit example to show that being decision aware is helpful. Uh, so consider two arm bandit, deterministic rewards. Okay, so it's a very dumb problem. Anytime you pull an arm, you know the reward, you're done. Okay, but we are going to run policy gradient on this uh, just to see what happens. Okay. Um, and we are going to use a linear parameterization for the critic. So arm one is optimal. And instead of knowing the Q, I'm going to estimate it by a linear parameterization. So it's XI times omega, everything is a scalar. Okay, so X1 is like the feature of ARM1, X2 is the feature of ARM2, and omega is the parameter I want to learn. Okay, so I want to estimate uh, the Q, Q hat, uh, meaning I want to find, learn these omegas such that I will lead, result in convergence to like the optimal solution, optimal policy. And the optimal policy is just full ARM1. Okay, so it's a very simple problem. Um, and no variance because everything is deterministic. Okay, so if PT is the probability of pulling the arm, optimal arm at iteration T, we are going to consider two ways to minimize, uh, to uh, estimate omega. One is minimize the TD, which is the squared, squared loss. Okay, so this is the squared loss between Q hat and Q1, and Q2 hat minus Q2, and weighed by the respective probability. The other way is to use a decision of error loss. So this thing is exactly the blue thing I showed you on the previous slide, but now for this bandit example. Okay, so all the states go away, it's only one state. So in and so this is the critic. The actor, I'm going to choose a tabular parameter. So I'm going to make keep it like very simple. Uh, there is one parameter, and that's the probability of pulling the optimal. And in this case, these updates look like exponential weights because we are like in this natural policy gradient type of this, um, and that's the way of updating the app. Okay. And the result is, one key thing is that because we have only one parameter, the problem is hard because you can't estimate both Q functions equally well, or, or like exactly. So it, you need to be careful where you place like this one parameter, what you learn. Okay. And the result we show is that for any step size, if I initialize the initial probability, less than two fifths, if you minimize the standard squared law, it will converge to the suboptimal action, even for like this two arm bandit example. But if you minimize the decision aware critic law for any C, for any P naught greater than zero, it will converge to the suboptimal okay? So this is the place where you have to be careful with how you spend your function capacity. And we have like a similar example for the softmax. So I'm not gonna go through the softmax. Any questions? Almost there. Okay, so let's. Uh, what can we prove? Ah, yes. And I'm mistaken that you could uh, not for this one, but for the softmax one, because if you look at this, the first no, sorry, the t second order Taylor series expansion of this is like a squared loss. But instead of on the Q functions, it is on the advantage. And then you start doing something simple. So you take this and do a second order Taylor T's expansion. You will get this, but instead of the Q, you will get an advantage. And then that is a simple, okay. more simple thing to do. Uh, so, Okay, another thing that will help is when this is minimized, this is minimized. Like when this is zero, this is zero. But when this is zero, this is not zero. 
So if you say, can we construct something where this works and this doesn't, the answer is no. Right, right, right. I'm thinking you Oh, I see. Question? Yes, that's right. Yes, so I think the thing that I want to basically, I think I should conclude, is that the critic loss depends on the actor objective. Right? So if you use squared in the actor objective, you can use a squared in the critic objective and the same guarantee will work. But if you mess with the actual objective, you have to mess with your critic. You can't use squared for everything. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so what do we lose? Um, so obviously we are not going to get convergence to a stationary point because we now have a critic error. Um, but what we can show is that for any policy or critic parameterization, there always exists a way to update the actor parameters and set this trade-off parameter C such that you always guarantee one autonomous policy. And this is strict. This is always uh, greater than zero. Uh, like the gap is always greater than zero. If and only if, so this is uh, necessary and sufficient, the critic error satisfies a certain condition. So basically what it's saying is that if the critic error is small enough, then you can you have a way to improve your policy. But if the critic error becomes above a certain threshold, there is no way you can improve that policy. Okay. And what does this condition look like? So for the simple, so it's like kind of ugly how the exact technical condition is, but for the tabular policy parameterization and the Euclidean mirror map, this condition is equivalent to this. So this is like saying the error is smaller than like the signal. So the uh, noise to signal ratio is like less than. And, and if you use a mirror map, then instead of the two norm here, the norm becomes induced in the Hessian of the mirror map. So you get an induced norm on both sides. So that's the only change. Don't know yet. No, don't know yet. But yes, that was one of the things we were thinking of. Yeah. Okay. And final result. Does this converge? Like this whole thing converge? It's easy to show. This is making the connection to mirror descent. That for any critic error, if you have some sort of gradient domination for the surrogate law, the actor critic algorithm will converge to a stationary point. The neighborhood of a stationary point at an order one over t rate, and the neighborhood depends on how much error you have and how many updates you're making. If you make many, many updates, the neighborhood shrinks. If the critic error becomes zero, then you get convergence to the stationary point, and that's the previous result. It's like kind of backward compatible. So if the critic error is small enough, you can get convergence to a stationary point. If the, for any critic error, at least you can be in the neighborhood of a stationary point. And the neighborhood, like if you look at these policy gradient papers, the neighborhood depends on the infinity norm um, between Q minus Q hat in the infinity norm. So the critic error in like this infinity norm, that's the size of the neighborhood. And that could be like potentially very large. But for us, the neighborhood depends on like the critic error, I should say. So it can be like zero when the infinity norm is not zero. So it's like slightly tighter in that sense. Okay. So, so uh, conclusion, we generalize this FMMPG thing to handle actor critics. And uh, we have like some sort some experiment, which I can show you if you're interested, uh, with linear parameterization that demonstrates being decision aware is kind of important when the critic is not as expressive. Because if you use like a very large model for the critic, it fits everything, and then it doesn't matter what loss you use. Um, we want to prove convergence rates to the neighborhood of the optimal policy. So this will involve looking at these uh, tabular papers, uh, tabular setting papers, and trying to modify them so that we can get convergence for our actor critic method. 
and we have no deep RL experiments yet. So that's a summer project for us uh, because we want to see if it actually like really works. Um, okay, that's my talk. Yeah, that's right. Um, uh, currently doing it. 